Good Sabbath. Sabbath. I'd like to welcome everybody to the Alfred Station Seventh-day Baptist Church, where we always like to say, if you happen to come along as a visitor, by the time you leave, you hope you feel a part of our church family. I'd like to welcome everybody looking in on the stream. We're glad to have you join us for worship. And uh, Pastor Ken asked that if you could, could you check in on your devices, either on Facebook or anybody with the devices here, so we can get a better count. Will you join me in the reading of our call to worship taken from Isaiah 1, verses 18? Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they are wood like wool. Our morning hymn will be not come the long expected Jesus. Will you read with me the affirmation of faith, the Nicene Creed? I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father, before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and was third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of God. And he shall come again, with glory to judge both the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceedeth from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets 
and I believe in one Catholic and Apostolic Church. I acknowledge on baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we give praise and welcome this first week of Advent, the Advent season of hope. As we prepare ourselves for this holy season, help us to see that you are always with us. You give the hope that says you remember your promises and fill those promises with your perfect timing. In this season, let us not focus on the material things that soon fade away, but on you, Father, who are eternal the giver of hope, the promises of better things to come. Help us to find joy in your presence today and to do the things that bring you glory. And shall we say the prayer that you taught your disciples? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The Christmas party was over. Several of the men were sitting at a table reminiscing about the Christmas days of their childhood. The conversation turned to the best Christmas of their lives. As they went around the table, they noticed one man hadn't said anything. They asked, come on, Frank, what was your best Christmas? Frank said, the best Christmas I ever had was when I didn't even get a present. The others were surprised. They had to hear the story. Frank began to talk. I grew up in New York. It was the Great Depression and we were poor. My mother had died when I was just eight years old. My dad had a job, but he only worked two or three days a week, and that was considered good. We lived in a walk-up, and we just barely had enough food and clothes. I was a kid and didn't really notice. My dad was a proud man. He had one suit. He would wear that suit to work. When he came home, he would take off his jacket and sit in his chair, still wearing his shirt, tie, and vest. He had this big old pocket watch that had been given to him by my mother. He would sit in his chair, the chain from watch hanging out, connected to the fob in his vest buttonhole. That watch was his proudest possession. Sometimes I would see him just sitting there looking at his precious watch. I bet he was thinking of my mother. One year, I was about 12. Chemistry sets were the big thing. They cost $2. That was big money, but every kid wanted a chemistry set, including me. I began to pester my dad about a month or so before Christmas. You know, I made all the same kid promises. I would be good. I would do my chores. I wouldn't ask for anything else. My dad would just say, we'll see. Three days before Christmas, he took me to the carts. There was this area where all the small merchants kept their street carts. They would undersell the stores, and you could get a good buy. He would take me to the cart and pick out some little toy. Son, would you like something like this? I, of course, would tell him, no, I want a chemistry set. We trampled to every cart and him showing me some toy car or toy gun and me refusing it. I never thought that he didn't have the money to buy a chemistry set. Finally, he said, we better go home and come back the next day. All the way home, I pouted and whined about the chemistry set. I repeated the promises. I said I didn't care if I got another present. I have to have that chemistry set. I know now that my dad felt guilty about not being able to give me more. 
he probably thought he was a failure as a father, and I think he blamed himself for my mother's death. As we were walking up the stairs, he told me that he would see what he could do about getting me that chemistry set. That night, I couldn't even sleep. I could see myself inventing some new material. I could see the New York Times, boy wins New York Nobel Prize. The next day after work, my father took me back to the carts. On the way, I remember he bought a loaf of bread. He was carrying it under his arm. We came to the first cart, and he told me to pick out a set I wanted. They were all alike, but I went through every one like I was choosing a diamond. I found the right one, and I almost yelled, this one, Dad. I can still see him reaching into his pants pocket to get the money. As he pulled the two dollars out, one fluttered to the ground. He bent over to pick it up, and as he did, the chain fell out of his vest. The chain swung back and forth. No watch. In a flash, I realized that my dad had sold his watch. He sold his most precious possession to buy me a chemistry set. He sold his watch, the last thing my mother had given him, to buy me that chemistry set. I grabbed his arms and I yelled, no. I had never grabbed my dad before, and I certainly had never yelled at him. I can see him looking at me, a strange look on his face. No, Dad, you don't have to buy me anything. The tears were burning in my eyes. Dad, I know you love me. We walked away from the cart, and I remember my dad holding my hand all the way home. Frank looked around at the men. You know, there isn't enough money in the world to buy that moment. You see, at that moment, I knew that my dad loved me more than anything in this world. This is the way that God loves us. He didn't just say it, he showed it. He gave the most precious thing anyone could give. He gave his son.
Well, we now come to our community at prayer. Do we have anybody this, this morning that's going to be celebrating a birthday this coming week? Oh, how about uh, anniversaries? Uh, Pastor Ken. Before we head to prayer, I would like to give you an invitation. The invitation that we would give you is one that uh, offers you an opportunity for systematic study of the Scripture. What does that mean? Well, it means that out on the marble table, there are helping hands. A helping hand is the adult and youth quarterly put out by the Seventh-day Baptist General Conference USA and Canada. And so if you have never tried to use a helping hand before, pick one up. If you have looked for a helping hand and couldn't find one, they're on the table. And so as you leave and you would desire, and the reason we're promoting it today is because tomorrow starts the new quarter, from December and January and February in this systematic study. Now, if you pick up the helping hand and you go through all the helping hands in five years, you will go through all the various sections of the scripture. But we're called to pray. We're called to hold each other up. We're called to praise God together. So let's seek the Lord now in our prayers. Heavenly Father, we are in the expected season. We expect the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We expect the moment in time to be able to occur where there will be those that we speak to of Jesus in this season who will come to a living relationship with Him. We expect, Father, both physical and and spiritual and mental healing to happen for those that we love. We expect that even with the distance that is around us, that in that distance you break through and we experience your loving kindness. So it is this Sabbath morning, Father, that we would pray for those who are who we know, who we care about, who, Father, are struggling with disease like cancer. We pray for those, Father, who we know who have heart issues, not just a spiritual heart issue, but a physical heart issue, and ask your touch upon them. We thank you, Father, that you have brought us together both face to face and in the cloud. And you have made us this Sabbath again one people as we gather to worship. And you have provided for us a unity that even the world doesn't know because it comes through our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray this morning, Father, for our brothers and sisters in Fort Lauderdale, we pray for Pastor Norman. We would ask, Father, that you're going to give grace to them that even in this season that they will experience the rich harvest of bringing folks to know Jesus. Our prayer, Father, this morning is for Ron Pinkerton in Kenya. And, Father, we understand that there has been violence in the area of Kenya we pray for protection, and we pray, Father, that he will be able to continue to carry out your ministry there. We think this morning, Father, of our sister Lucinda and her family, and we would ask, Father, that you would pour out heavenly blessing upon them. 
And that, Father, that there will be with Lucinda a remembrance of the covenant relationship which we have. We pray this morning for our Seventh-day Baptist brothers and sisters in Ethiopia. We know, Father, of the violence that is in the northern part of the country due to the rebellion and what some have called civil war. And knowing that many of those who are now our brothers and sisters in Ethiopia are there because they fled as refugees from the Sudan. Watch over them and care for them and allow them to know, Father, that the brothers and sisters pray for them. We think this morning, Father, of those that we know who are on the armed forces, those, Father, who are serving, that we might enjoy the freedom that we have today. And right now, Father, we speak their names to you. We speak to you right now, Father, of those that things in our life which even that we haven't told our closest loved ones, but we want to talk to you about them. Lift them from our soul, lift them from our inside, and let us in this moment speak to you of them. And then, Father, because you've called us to pray for one another, speak to us the name or the names of persons that we know, either in the cloud or here face to face, or those, Father, that you will just bring to our remembrance, where we ask upon them blessing upon blessing. And now in this day in which we remember the hope that we have in Jesus, make that hope spring alive within our souls. Allow us, Father, to, with that hope, to be able to understand, to take away the darkness that's in this world. You have conquered, Father, both death and the grave. And you have given your people even this day, the hope of victory. In the name of our Lord Christ, amen.
scripture this morning comes from Isaiah 40, verse 3, and Matthew 3, verses 1 through 3. A voice is calling, clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness, make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. Now in those days, John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, for this is the one referred to by Isaiah the prophet when he said, the voice of the one crying in the wilderness, make ready the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Well, this is the first Sabbath in Advent. And the Lord knows that we need this first Sabbath. Most of us have had some sort of experience with the virus since March. We've seen things upset within our country. We've wondered what's happening next. And unfortunately for us, most of the time we feel like, Lord, in your providence, this is what you're doing? So we need this first Advent Sabbath. Advent called hope. We want hope to happen. It's like we see now with hope the light at the end of the tunnel and we say it can't be the engine of the train coming with its light on. Hope. Hope offers us the opportunity to know that there is a reality to our faith For what we hope for, and that which we don't see, is faith. Now, this morning what we want to do, and throughout this Advent season we're going to do, we're going to look at an Old Testament passage. And then we're going to go over to the New Testament as it were fulfillment with the birth and relate it to our Lord Jesus Christ. So this morning we begin in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah, Isaiah that's going to prophesy, and in the 40th chapter, the third verse, we're going to learn about a voice calling or saying something, hearkening in the wilderness. But Before we get to that third verse, for a moment, let's look at verses 1 and 2. So if you have your Bibles, if in digital form, or you brought it from home, take and open it up. If not, take a look at it later this afternoon. You see, the scripture is going to start here with a couple words in the very first verse. Comfort, comfort my people, says the Lord. Twice, twice, the word comfort is used here which says it's very, very important for us to pay attention to these words. For even though they're going to apply to Israel, and even though they're going to apply to Jerusalem, by implication, they also apply to us because we are part of that my people. Now, what does the word my mean? It means it belongs, right? Husbands say, this is my wife. We belong together. Or we say, this is my sports team. I'm watching them and they belong to me. Or visit the nursery sometime. And you'll find a little one there who grabs a hold of the toy and says, my toy. Don't anybody try to take it away from me. Oh, by the way, the toy you have is also my toy. It belongs. And God is saying here, I want something to happen for my people. Something very important. I want them to be comforted. And now, 
The second verse comes along. And in that second verse, we find something that's very significant. Because you see, God is taking the emotions that he has in the first verse. And he is an emotional God. He's taking that and he's saying now, I want to tell my people they have something. It is called rest. Your warfare has ended. Your iniquity is forgiven. And he's saying that to Jerusalem, but it's the same kinds of words that we have. And essentially he's saying in our spiritual struggles, we have because of hope, rest. 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 Stop struggling. Your warfare has ended. You really are forgiven of your sins. That's the relationship of the birth of Jesus. It's not an if and but. Maybe it is. And then because Jesus is the Son of God, we could say, we could hear His words come, coming. All you that labor and are heavy laden, when you come unto me, you're going to find rest. Okay, now that brings us to our major verse today. There's going to be a voice. Notice, it has no body. In fact, a couple other voices are going to happen in this same chapter, and they have no body. It's just a voice. And look what the voice is doing. He's acting as the herald for the king. He's saying, I am a voice, and where am I at? I'm in a wilderness. Now, don't think of the wilderness as people with machetes going through the jungle. Think of the wilderness that is mixed with trees and mostly, though, pasture, where you take your herd out and you let them graze for a while. You see, that's the kind of wilderness here, but it's described in other ways. And Notice from the verse 3 that as we have this verse 3, the person is acting as the king's herald and he's saying what we want to do is we want to build a king's highway. We want to have the king, as it were, come to his people. Now, it also tells us who the people are. If you look at the word Lord in your Bibles, you will find that they're all in capital letters. Capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. They're all in capital letters, which means that the translator is trying to protect the name of the God of the covenant, the name Yahweh or the name of Jehovah. He's protecting that. So when you read that, you know I'm talking about the name of the God of the covenant, but I'm talking about that so I don't have to use that name as I read the Old Testament, and the translators are protecting that. For what we have here is the voice crying the wilderness is saying, I want to prepare the way for the God of the covenant to come to his people. Look how that's going to happen. And understand there are no bulldozers. There are no graders. Understand that this is being called for by the one who is heralding here. He says, this is what I want to ha happen. I want to create a highway for the king and in that creation of the highway for the king, I want a road cut through the wilderness. Not only do I want a road cut through the wilderness, I want every valley to be raised up. I want a smooth place through the desert. I want every mountain to be cut down and leveled. I want the rough places to become a plain. And I want even the rough, rough places 
to become, as it were, a valley that can be walked on. And all of this was a command that was to be done by hand. And it's over in the Old Testament, in the book of Isaiah, the 40th chapter, the third verse. Now, here's something we have to say again. And it's an old adage that uh, pastors often use. It goes like this. The Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. And the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. So you have concealed, you have revealed, and one and the other, and they're connected with each other. Do not try to read the New Testament completely through and ignore the Old Testament. Do not try to read the Old Testament and ignore, ignore the New Testament. So we're not going to ignore the New Testament. And we're going to see the connection because now we turn and we go to Matthew, the third chapter. And in Matthew, the third chapter, the third verse, it says this. This one is the voice crying in the wilderness that Isaiah talked about. So we go to Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. We connect it with Matthew chapter 3 and verse 3. And there we find a proclamation by Matthew. Now remember, Matthew is writing after the events that he's describing here. He doesn't write it as the event occurred. He's writing it for the rest of the people of God who are in that day becoming believers to be able to know what went on. Now, Matthew obviously knows his Old Testament. He knows this verse. And under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he uses the verse that's found in Isaiah, and he says, let me tell you its fulfillment, its completeness. Now, some of you, I know, have studied Bible prophecy. Some of you like it very much. Well, here's one of the things you need to say about most Bible prophecy. It speaks to the moment in time, and then it echoes down the generations until it comes to a complete fulfillment. It speaks in the moment in time that it was written for, and then echoes through the generation until it comes to a complete fulfillment. So Isaiah 40 and verse 3 was for that day that Isaiah wrote in. And then it began to echo through the prophets, through Amos, through Micah, through Malachi. And finally, look what Matthew said. This one, this one makes it complete. This one finishes the prophecy. This one is preparing the way of the Lord. Now, how's he doing that? Well, go back to the two verses before three, and you will discover that First of all, it says, now John the Baptist comes doing something. He's calling people to repentance. That means turning around and facing the other direction. God is looking at us. Our backs are turned on him. And John says, I want you to repent. I want you to face the direction that God is because God doesn't move away from you, but we turn our backs on him. Paul, John is saying to that generation, hey, you're here, you're at the water, you're at the River Jordan, I want you to repent. Why? It says in these verses, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The only way the kingdom of heaven can be at hand is if the king was coming. And the king is coming. 
John is his cousin, by the way, six months older. He doesn't even know who this guy is until he's revealed to him. And that is the one we call Jesus. John is preparing the way for the king. And thus Matthew says, this is the fulfillment. You see, for so many centuries, these people have looked for a voice crying in the wilderness, preparing the way of the Lord, and all they had was hope. All they had was hope. And finally, the reality of that hope was fulfilled in John the Baptist saying, I'm preparing the way. Repent and be baptized for remission of sins. Hope, hope was fulfilled. As we look towards the coming of the Lord Christ in the first advent, here's something to remember. The second advent hasn't happened yet. Has it? I mean, none of you guys are still here, so am I. The second advent hasn't happened yet. It hasn't happened, and according to Peter, the scoffers are going to come and they're going to say, everything continues just the way it was. For centuries and centuries and centuries, it hasn't happened. But here's the news. When God says it, it is as if it is accomplished. Isaiah said there would be one coming, a voice crying in the wilderness. It was accomplished. And Jesus said, I am coming again. And it is as if it is an accomplished no matter how long it takes, God keeps His word. And we are left to hope. Let's pray. Father, thank You for Your love. Thank You for this word of Scripture. Thank You that You fulfill Your word. We heard about it so long ago when Isaiah wrote it. And it seems so long ago when John the Baptist was the fulfillment. Now, Father, teach us in this time of what seems to be hurt and pain how we can hope in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.
God is good. So you're from the cloud or you're in the fog or here face to face, I invite you to stand for the benediction. And now may the love of God the Father, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each of us from this Sabbath into eternity. Good Sabbath.